introductory material. I know we still have some folks coming in um, to the Zoom room, but I'd like to welcome you all to the UW Data Science Seminar, um, where we showcase data science and the arts, engineering, humanities, and sciences. Um, just a reminder that um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation, and please use the Q&A feature um, to um, add, ask your questions. Um, and um, you'll see that Q&A feature. It's for, for most folks, it's down at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on Q&A, you can type in your question there. Um, also a reminder that next week's um, UW Data Science Seminar is on break for the holiday. And so we will be reconvening next on um, Tuesday, December 1st. So I'm delighted today to introduce um, Lak Lakshmanan. Um, Lak is currently the Director of Data Analytics and AI Solutions for Google Cloud. In his role, he leads a team that builds software solutions for cross-industry business problems using Google Cloud's data analytics and machine learning products. Um, he's been with Google for more than four years, previously serving as the tech lead for big data and ML professional services. He has a background in using ML to study meteorology. Um, previously to Google, he was director of meteorology at the Climate Corporation. And he, almost, he also spent almost 20 years as a research scientist at the University of Oklahoma National Severe Storm Lab. Um, he holds a PhD from the University of Oklahoma in electrical and computer engineering. Um, today, he will be talking with us about image embeddings in machine learning as a way to create a concise lower dimensional representation of complex unstructured data. We're very pleased to have you here. Thank you, Lek. Thank you, Sarah. It's, it's great to be here. So I'm going to be talking about like creating image embeddings, but you know, before that, why weather images and what's Google doing in weather images? And then I'll talk about what embeddings are. I'll talk about the kind of images that I'm going to be using, which are from a rapid refresh weather forecasting model. Uh, and then I'll get into the methodology, how to create embeddings from weather images. And then we will finally look at some of the nice properties that these embeddings have, properties that enable us to do all of these things, search, interpolation, and clustering. So why, are, you know, why am I interested in weather forecasts? Well, one of the things that Google does is that we provide uh, a lot of emergency messages. So if you've, uh, you know, there's uh, this whole idea of a public alert system that you get uh, both on the website, but now of course, increasingly on mobile. So, and these are surfaced through Google search, through Google maps and on like Android phones. And uh, for a long time, whenever we did all of these things, we were essentially passing along the uh, forecast that came from uh, the governmental agencies. But then over time, we started realizing that there were some things that we could improve upon. So for example, what you see on the left is what the flood forecast in India would look like using public sources. Whereas you now we have much higher resolution digital elevation maps. So we can actually compute inundation a bit better. So that's what you see on the right. And all of these dark splotches you see are the you know, population clusters. And as you can see, there's a huge difference in terms of the number of people who have to get evacuated. For example, if you're able to restrict the, uh, the area that is warned. So, there's, so we've started to work with government agencies on improving various aspects of their, of, like, their, their forecasting ability. And an example of that is in India itself, we're working on creating these live systems. So this is working with the uh, Indian Meteorological Department. Uh, so, so what we showed you, right, this is basically what that would look like. And it turns out that the higher resolution images have much higher precision, much higher recall. And so it basically provides uh, a better uh, warning experience. And this is not so... That's one, you know, those are the kinds of things that Google has been working with. And uh, in, recently we started working with NOAA in the United States as well on improving various aspects of, of weather forecasting, in particular things like data assimilation using AI. So having said that, 
My talk today is going to be around embeddings because it turns out that you want to create embeddings to support a very wide variety of image-based use cases. So what exactly are embeddings? So let's uh, step away from images and think about a traditional uh, recommendation problem because you know, embeddings come from, image, from machine learning, computer science. So let's go ahead and say that we have 10 million customers, we have 500,000 movies, and some of those customers have used, watched a few of those movies and they have rated them. But of course, the number of movies that you have watched or I have watched is a small subset of the total number of movies. So if you were to think of this as a matrix, it's gonna be extremely sparse. And so when you want to recommend movies to customers, we have to kind of look at some sort of similarity. We have to look at having rated in this movie, you would like other movies that are similar to this one. So one way that you could do the similarity thing is by maybe you have an idea of the average age of the viewers of a movie, and you could organize all the movies from left to right with Shrek being watched by really young people and Memento being watched by much older people. So you could basically say that is one uh, sort of organization. And then you could say that people who like Shrek are likely to also like Incredibles because they, they target the same kind of age group. Of course, if you could have other dimensions, it's gonna make it a lot nicer. So let's say we had another piece of data that is the amount of uh, sales, the box office nature of the movie. And then you could say that things that are more art house movies are at the bottom and the ones that are viewed, watched by lots of people are at the top. And having these things means that you get to have multiple uh, you know, ways in which you can think of similarity. And so if your input has n dimensions, you have n variables on it, you could basically say that I'm gonna take all of the data that I have about a movie and reduce it to d dimensions, right? So although there's a lot of information that we know about movies, how long they run, who's in them, the actors, etc., you could say that I'm gonna take all of that data and reduce it to be a d-dimensional value. That d-dimensional value is essentially what we're calling an embedding. It's this lower dimensional value. And of course, in this case, when I talked about my two-dimensional embedding here, I said that these things have, understand they're understandable like the left is children and the right is adult, at the bottom is art house and at the top is blockbuster. But you don't have to have names for these things. Explainability is nice, but it is not essential. But the key thing is that given any movie, we now can represent it by two numbers. And those two numbers form the embedding. So Shrek, for example, has that embedding of negative one on the children's scale and 0.95 on the blockbuster scale. Now, how do you get to these numbers? These numbers, right, you, you obviously don't want to uh, take human knowledge and start encoding it. That would not be machine learning. You'd want to learn it from data. So one of the ways that you would want to do this is that you would take all of your movies and you might one hot encode them. So Shrek would be have one in the first column and zeros everywhere else. Incredible would have one in the second column and zeros everywhere else. So you basically have your uh, one hot encoding and then you want to basically pass it through some kind of a neural network to get your embedded layer. The question is, how do you train this embedding layer? How do you get what, the, what a good value ought to be? You need to have some kind of a measure. You need to some, have some kind of a learning task. So one way to do this is to basically go ahead and take a particular learning task. Maybe, for example, you're trying to say, okay, you know, I, I want to basically get the embedding of words in a real estate ad. So you take all of the words in the real estate ad, you want how to encode them, and you train an ML model to predict the price of a house. You can take our movies example. You might basically take your movie data, one hot encode it, and predict how long uh, the, that movie would get watched or, or, or something like that, right? You basically take a traditional classification or regression problem and you learn the weights for this embedding layer. So in this case, the embedding layer is a three-dimensional embedding. We, we one hot encode the words and we pass it through this three-dimensional one and what we are essentially saying is that all the information 
that's present in the words of the real estate ad, by the time it gets to the, the final learning task, these words have been represented by three numbers, and those are the three best numbers to represent any individual word because that's what supports that particular learning task. So the idea here is to come up with a learning task wherein you can take the one heart encoded value for your categorical variables and you can train them. So that's great. Like what this has done is that it basically gives you dimensionality reduction. So let's say, for example, you have an image, Let not take our traditional MNIST problem. You have a hand drawn digit of 28 by 28, 784 numbers, and you could choose to basically represent them with a three dimensional embedding in order to train an image classification model. And at that point, you've basically taken all your pixel data and you've represented it by a three dimensional embedding. So embeddings give you this dimensionality reduction. That's what embeddings are. It's a way of basically creating a, a, a lower dimensional representation of your data, which is higher dimensions, and you learn them as a learning task in machine learning. The particular thing that I want to create embeddings are, are of weather forecast images. So the particular type of weather forecast images that I want to do this on is the output of numerical weather models. So in this case, the model is called a high resolution rapid refresh model. It's at three kilometer resolutions. It's produced every hour. So that's what you see at the top here. At 13Z, you basically got mod model outputs for 14Z, 15Z, 16Z, et cetera. So you basically have our, the hourly forecasts and these are produced on the hour. So you basically have a bunch of different forecasts that are created. And each of these forecasts have a variety number of fields like they're basically what you're seeing in the image here is that we're predicting the wind those are these arrows here you're seeing the uh, pressure bars isobars and you're also seeing reflectivity which is what you tend to see on say you know when you if you're looking on tv at looking at pictures of storms these tend to be radar images that's a radar reflectivity simulated from the weather forecast model so this is basically the data that i have and all of these data the is being is these models are initialized from current observations. So even though the, the forecast, so when, if you take a forecast of say pressure, for example, you actually measure pressure only at a few locations on the, on the earth, it's a point observation. And from that, the model has to basically go ahead and figure out a gridded, gridded field of pressure at different heights, many of which are not measured. On the other hand, if you take radar that's simulated, it, the model itself is initialized by radar images. So it basically gives you a much closer correspondence between what is observed and what the model produces. So in this case, right, so on the left is what the model is. On the right-hand side is what the actual radar observations were. It is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So for example, there's a big uh, area here that is not filled in. That's probably what's called cone of silence. There's a part of the radar of the storm that the radar is not able to see, but the model is able to look at the physics and say, okay, this thing, actually there are storms there and fill them up. So it is not identical, but the, the model radar fields tend to basically reflect what the model thinks is actually going on in terms of the, the actual weather situations. Okay. So, we want to basically go, we want to create embeddings of weather images. And whenever you said you want to do machine learning on a field like weather, the biggest problem here is how to get ready access to a large amount of data. As, as we know, right? If you want to train a, a decent image classification model from scratch, you need on the order of about a million images. That's, that's a lot, right? And not only do you need a million images, you need those images to be labeled. You need to know the correct answer for them. In a field like weather, like this radar images, for example, the US itself has like 150 radars. Each of these basically observes only a small part of the continental US. And you need to basically do a lot of work to go ahead and get this data, download it, right, uh, from all of these data. So it's all available, it's all public domain, but it's extremely hard to work with. And as with any machine learning problem, just getting access to the data and transforming it and making it amenable to work with is a huge issue, which is why it's kind of nice 
that all of these historical archives of data are these days public data sets on, on the clouds, whether it's the Amazon cloud or the Google cloud or the Microsoft cloud. We all have public data sets and the, the weather data from NOAA tends to be available on all of, all, all of these clouds. So in this case, right, so there is a bucket on Google Cloud called High Resolution Rapid Refresh, and that contains all of the forecasts produced at, so in this case, this is the August 11th uh, forecast, and that's in, in this case, I'm looking for the zero zero, which is the, what's called the analysis hour, the first hour that's being produced out of these models. And so you basically have all of the data, these are distributed in a format called GRID2, so we have this data, it's readily accessible, and that's basically what I'm going to use to create my embeddings. So this data is, a, is as grip files, and one of the problems is that this grip file is like 100 megabytes of data, but what I want from there is just the reflectivity data, which is one megabyte. And you now reading 100 megabytes of data just to extract one MB from that file is pretty problematic. And the, the, the data format itself was basically devised by the WMO sometime in the 80s. So it's really old. It doesn't actually support uh, seeking. It doesn't support reading on the fly, etc. The files have to be local. So bottom line is, if I started to read this data directly into my ML model, my machine learning model is going to run much, much, much longer than it needs to. So what I want to do is to basically convert it into a format that is much more amenable to ML. So what I'll do is I'll convert them into TensorFlow records because I'm going to be using TensorFlow. So in this case, I'll basically read, read the files, convert them into TF records, and rather than read all of the files because weather doesn't change that often, I'll only read the data once an hour. So I'll basically go ahead and read the analysis. Not The whole data comes in every 15 minutes, so I'll just ignore about three quarters of the data, I'll only read about one fourth of the data. I'll convert them into TensorFlow records. And in these TensorFlow records will be the actual pixel data that I want to convert. So what I now have is a tensor corresponding to each image, which is basically a two dimensional array of images and an array of images. Now this is what I need to basically do the embedding of. So the original dimensionality, this is very, very much like if I one heart and encoded the movies, right? I basically got a bunch of data for the, for the number of movies that I have. It's very similar here. I basically have 1059 times 1799 on the order of 2 million pixels for every image. And I want to take those 2 million pixels and represent them much more compactly because doing trying to do search and things like that on 2 million pixels is going to be extremely hard considering also the amount of data that we have. So how do I take those 2 million pixels and create embeddings out of them, right? So remember what we talked about. If you want to create embeddings, you need a learning task. So in other words, if I wanted to do MNIST, the classification, I would take the pixel data and I would basically train an image classification model to basically identify what's in the image, what number is in the image. What this means is that my data has to be labeled. I don't want to go through and label all of this her data sets. And what do I label the mass? So this whole idea of getting a learning task on something on like the weather data is going to be pretty obnoxious. I want to find an easier way. So the easier way is to think about how can I get an auxiliary learning task? And what do you mean with that? Take, for example, word embeddings. The way that you do this is that instead of making it a supervised model where you have to go ahead and find labels for everything. You're trying to figure out the easiest way to get a, get a learning task where the data is already all present. So for example, you might take a book and you might say for in every, every sentence of the book, I'll basically take a few of the words the cat sits on the, and then train the model to take these things as the input and predict the word mat. The, the nice thing about this is that you're predicting what comes next, that's great but you don't need to actually go ahead and hand label anything because that's already present in the data itself. It is not the problem that you want to solve. The problem that you may want to solve may be some kind of text classification, but in this case, you learn how to 
compactly represent words by training an auxiliary auxiliary learning task where you can you can do it on a much 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 larger data set than what you actually have access to so in the case of images what is a good auxiliary learning task a good learning task is what's called an auto encoder so the idea is you, you take an image and then you basically represent all of the pixels as inputs and then you basically have some kind of an ml model and you you reduce the dimensionality and then you get it down to this what's called a bottle, bottleneck layer or a latent layer of in this case two dimensions and then you build another ml model on the right hand side that tries to basically get back the original image and now you basically have an auxiliary learning task where you're trying to create a network that given this input will produce a reconstructed image that is as close to the original input as possible the good thing is that by making the model structure of this form all of the information content that's present in the image has to get condensed into two numbers and it's from these two numbers that this entire reconstructed image has to come out of so you're looking at how to create the most compact representation of an image and you're basically specifying the size of the embedding here to make sure that you're creating it so this is called an auto encoder and that's the basic idea that i'm going to use so in this case i basically have 1059 by 1799 images and it's kind of you know we don't want to have numbers that are odd numbers it's going to have problems so what i'll do is that i'll go ahead and i'll crop them in this case because uh, I really don't care. You know, the herd goes down to parts of Mexico, goes up into parts of Canada, so it's easy enough to uh, go ahead and crop it out. Same way, there's a bit of the ocean that I'm basically cropping out, taking away like 10 kilometers of the coastline. Big deal, right? So basically, crop this thing, crop these images out, and then pass it through a number of layers. And these layers, because these are images, I'm going to use convolutional layers. I'm going to use max pooling. And then I'll and then uh, reduce them all the way down to some number, right? Uh, we need to figure out what that number is. In this case, I'm showing an example of 50. So I'm taking 2 million pixels and I'm reducing them into 50 numbers. So in the, the equivalent here is that this is 2 million pixels, and I'm basically reducing them into a, into a latent dimension of 50. So I'm getting it down into 50. That's the encoder architecture. So taking the, the images and getting them down to 50. And then the right-hand side is a decoder architecture, starting from those 50 and coming back to the 1059 by 1799. And then you define a loss function that basically says the difference between the input and output should be as small as possible. The model is going to try to, try to tune this on the entire data set in such a way that the weights in the encoder are able to basically reduce the information content in the images into 50 numbers. So that's the basic point. Now, how do I know 50 is the right number? How do I know how many of these layers do I need? How do I know what the stride size is? I really don't. So what I do is I basically create a hyperparameter tuner. I say, go ahead and please look at different numbers of layers, different sizes of pool sizes, different numbers of filters and different numbers of embeddings and try to basically pick the one that results in the lowest loss given right that I don't want to basically uh, you know, exactly copy and memorize the image. So I penalize extremely large embeddings on extremely large models. So I, I limit the model size to 1 million parameters, which is how I, how I, how I basically put that constraint on the hyperparameter tuner, and then I overfit, I overfit those hyperparameters on just four images, which is kind of strange. Why am I doing that? The reason is that you know, later on, I can go ahead and train on a very large data set, but I want to make sure that the model that I end up creating is capable of representing, it has enough, uh, enough ability to to learn an image, to learn all the information content of an image. So I'm not really looking at 
fitting it right now. I'm just, uh, or I'm not worried about regularization or anything like that. I want to make sure that the model itself is capable of learning what needs to get learned. And you can do that by overfitting a really small batch. And then take those model parameters and train it on a whole year of model output data. Right? So I'm just pa no, passing this on and using the hyperparameters that I've learned work well on those four images. It can learn, learn all of the information content in those four images. So the model itself, I know, has the learning capability. So at this point, I've basically trained the embedding network, and I can go ahead and uh, you know, run it on all of the uh, you know, year of data that I have, and I can create the embedding of every weather forecast image. What do I do with these embeddings? What, what help is it? Well, one of the things is that if the embedding is well behaved, I mean, we don't know this yet, right? We've created an embedding and we hope that it will have nice properties. But if it does, right? If it does, then a common thing that we find is that similar items are close to each other in embedding space. So in this case, I'm showing you the embedding of MNIST. And each of these is a different, like all of the reds, for example, here are nines. And all of these blues are ones. And you see that all of the ones kind of cluster together. All of the nines kind of cluster together. And the nines and the eights are relatively close. So all of these are the nines. All of these are the eights. And as you can imagine, nine and eight look kind of very similar. There's just one stroke that differs them. And four and nine, these are the fours, are again very similar to the nine because, again, there's just one extra stroke that the nine has. So these are the kinds of things that you can look at an embedding and you can realize that the embedding is learning these closeness relationships between, between the things that you have trained on so similar items are close to each other. And also these vector directions have meaning. So on the left, on this one here is the MNIST embeddings. They have those properties. You can see that also in word embeddings, like the ones that you train on predicting the next word in a sequence. It turns out that once you do that, then the difference between the vector direction between man and woman, if you take that vector direction and you add it to king, you will land up at queen, right? So those vector dimensions make have meaning as well. Similarly, like you know, you can do verb tense. You know, the the uh, vector change between walking and walk. If you make that same addition to the word swimming, you will land up at the word swam. So those are the kinds of so all of these things, the closeness relationship, the directions, all of these have meaning in this compact representation. So it isn't just some arbitrary compact representation, right? In these cases, in the cases of images with MNIST, in the case of word embeddings, they turn out to have meaning. The question is, in my weather embeddings, do those meanings exist? Do they have them, okay? So again, uh, it's uh, another example of uh, similarity properties of embeddings is how a lot of song recommendations are done. It turns out that you can basically take the embedding of, of two songs and songs that are similar in genre, they use similar notes, they have similar tones, they have similar embedding. So you can use the embedding property to find similar, similar songs and similar sounds and use them to recommend uh, you know, music as well. So to weather, what does my embedding do? So this is basically the way I'm taking my embedding. I'm taking the radar, the reflectivity data from the weather forecast images. And if I take a reflectivity image and I call my encoder, which is the first part of my embedding architecture, and I say, go ahead and predict on this, on this reflectivity image, I will get an embedding. That embedding is gonna have 50 numbers because that's what I trained my embedding to do to reduce these this uh, reflectivity image into 50 numbers. If I take those 50 numbers and pass them through my decoder, then I will get an output image. And the output image is a blurred form of the input image. It's not, it's not a perfect representation because, hey, I'm taking 2 million values and I'm representing them with 50 numbers. It's a lossy representation, 
but it is a blurry version of the original data that tells us that there are going to be some properties that sort of make sense. So let's say, for example, right, we have these embeddings and we can basically go through our entire data set and say, find me all of the images that are similar to September 20th, 2019. So if I want to find similarity in images, I don't have to go and get the original her data anymore. I can just compare these embeddings. So I can take the embedding of tw September 20, 2019 and find all of the embeddings the rest of the year and do a Euclidean distance between 50 numbers, which is really, really fast. I can do that in SQL. I can do that in a, in a, in a matter of seconds. And when you do this, it turns out that if I take September 20, 2019, the closest images, of course, September 20, 2019 at 5 UTC, the distance is zero, duh, it has to be because I'm, I'm searching just for that. But then what is the next closest? Well, that's the image at 6 UTC and then 4 UTC, so we're an hour off. What is the next closest? 7 UTC and 3 UTC, two hours off. It makes sense. The weather doesn't change that dramatically. So if you look for images that are really close and look very similar to a single image, then those are the images that are just before and after that time step. That's great, but that's not really what we want. What we really want is to find weather analogs, right? So let's remove images from plus or minus one day because a lot of storm systems last like a couple of days. So I'll basically remove everything from one day, but remembering also that I've just done this on one year of data. So when I do this, here is the original image that I'm searching off of. And it turns out that January the uh, no, new January 1 and July 1 are the two closest days. And this is what they look like. Okay. So you notice that uh, you know the difference between these two, just like, again, the difference between a 4 and a 9 is one stroke. The difference between this image and this image is the, is the amount of widespread uh, activity in this part of the country, whereas, whereas no, they're the bottom part, right, they both have weather at those parts. This one is like very similar to this, but it's like more subdued. So the idea is that that idea that if we look for similar images, we will find uh, you know, days with similar activity. That seems to hold true, but it's very unlikely that we will get the same weather across the entire country. So if we're going to be doing search, it looks like we should basically focus on mesoscale phenomena, not over the entire country, but instead tile these images and learn embeddings not of the entire country, but maybe of say thousand by thousand kilometer tiles. So that's the way that you would probably get more meaningful search not of the entire country, but of slightly smaller tiles. So you can basically then take this thing once you've done it, and then you can basically use it to search for case studies very similarly. So this September 20th that I was searching for is what's called a derecho event. So if you want to find other derechos, it becomes a lot easier if you basically have the embeddings already present. It becomes a very easy data set search for different types of weather phenomena and say, show me all of the cases where there is a supercell and you should be able to find all of your supercells. The second uh, idea here is that, you know, embeddings have this closeness relationship, sure it seems to be, which means that can we now use it for now casting? So what now casting is, is this idea that uh, when you want to do a forecast of say, 15 minutes ahead or 30 minutes ahead, it's often useful to simply take the current weather image and morph it slightly forward in time. Okay. That morphing is a very fast operation and it can basically give you a pretty good uh, you know, now cast, right? So for very short, short forecasts. So in order to do this, we want to say, okay, how good is, uh, uh, is this thing at identifying what's going to happen uh, two storms as they change over time. So what I did here was that I basically took uh, uh, the weather image an hour before and hour after, and I averaged the two of them, and that is my estimate of what the current image should look like. And then I looked at this difference. 
And the idea is that if this difference is small enough, then it seems to indicate that interpolation actually works. I can interpolate between two images and you can basically get that. And it turns out that, yep, it does. And you can basically interpolate and that, that difference that you get is much smaller than the difference between two successive time steps. So meaning that uh, you can interpolate these embeddings and you can use these interpolated embeddings to do now casting. Of course, nobody wants to see a blurred now cast. So if you're gonna do interpolation, what we have to change here is the size of our embedding. We cannot do 50 pixels. We may have to do much more, right? We have to lose less information here. The third idea that we said like we could talk about with embeddings is that you could cluster these embedding vectors. So you now a common thing is, okay, I have had all this weather. Can we now take these weather images and cluster them in say five categories and do these categories make sense? So that's basically what I'm doing. I'm basically taking my embeddings and I'm applying a k-means algorithm to those embeddings and saying, please go ahead and create five clusters. Once I get my five clusters, I'm now taking the centroids of those five clusters and I can take those centroids and I can decode them and I will get back the you know, a, a, a simulated reflectivity image. So this is what five clusters on 2019 data looks like. So you basically have one cluster which is basically consisting of strong supercellular activity in the Midwest. You have another which is basically a lot, a lot of storms on the East Coast. Okay. You have a third one which is a lot of stuff going on, right? A lot of convection. And this one is like a squall line. But what I thought very unusual here, or maybe usual, is that all five of these images have rain in Seattle. Uh, figures, right? And, and, and with that, I come to the end of my talk, right? So here's a link. Uh, so if you're interested in basically getting uh, the link to my notebook, links to the code itself, okay? So, so this is how you can get it. So uh, just search for the title of this talk or you can find it from my Medium post. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, that was outstanding. Um... Uh, we, we will wait for a moment while folks ask questions. And as a reminder, you can ask questions by using the, the Q&A bubble chat on the bottom of your uh, Zoom window. Um, well, I could ask you a question while we're waiting. If sure. that's fine. <laughs> I was wondering, like, um, what are the overall other applications of this analysis? Like you're searching through um, radar images, you're finding similarities, patterns. You mm -hmm. are also analyzing these images um, for flood forecasting purposes. Is right, that I mean, yeah, that's the ultimate, ultimate use cases are around emergency weather and data simulation and so on. Uh, but in this case, the, the, the problem is much more constrained. It is, uh, we have a bunch of data, we need to be able to find case studies much quicker for a variety of different applications, we want to be able to represent images in a more compact way. So how do we do that? And the way we do that is, is embeddings. And these are much more general. So we can, as I said, I talked about three use cases, talked about how to, how to use them for clustering, how to use them for weather analogs, how to use them for now casting. But you, you know, there's a variety of other use cases. The whole idea here is given a weather data set, being able to represent it compactly and concisely is useful in a variety of different situations. So this is more of a, of a, of a building block uh, that's, you know, that works for a variety of different problems. Excellent, yeah. And um, it looks like we do have some questions. Uh, yeah, we have some that are coming in. Um, uh, I'll read the first one, Nicoletta. So, um, uh, uh, can you comment on why you're using some of these embeddings uh, over traditional um, other types of dimensionality reduction that's been done? Uh, yeah, th yeah that, that's a great question. There are other types of dimensionality reduction. I could have done things like wavelets, for example. The issue, the, yeah, the, the, the issue here is that I want to basically take, like, things like wavelets are very localized. 
And I wanted, like, if you looked at my cluster at the very end, one of my clusters was a squall line. Obviously, that squall line is not present only at this location. The squall line basically typically starts in the Rockies and marches all the way east. But you notice how strong that squall line signature is. I would not get that if I, had, if I did something like a wavelet that was very localized. It would basically blur this thing over the entire entire country. I would not get that structure that, 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 you, that you want. That's great. Nicoletta, do you, is there another one there? Um, yeah, there's, there's more. Um, here's one from Jeffrey. He says, great talk, thanks. I can't wait until I test this out, <laughs> right? So awesome. here you have your first user. <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I am left wondering about scale and the size of the domain of embeddings. Thought much more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, really like you know, uh, the scale at which you do the embeddings is going to depend on a couple, uh, is, is going to basically depend on a couple of things. Firstly, the size of the uh, geographic domain that you pick. In this case, I picked the entire continental United States. So I'm good, that's going to support use cases at the level of the continental US. If you want to do mesoscale phenomena, you probably want to use a smaller uh, size uh, tiles, something like say 1000 kilometer by 1000 kilometer tiles or on that order of magnitude. So that's one level of scale. The second level of scale is I just did it for one year of data, 2019. In reality, you want to build this corpus for many, many years, as many years. In this case, unfortunately, the HER is the model that has, is, has not been around long enough. So I couldn't go back beyond say mid 2018. But you know, if, if I had that data, we could actually go back as, as much as we can. And to be, to be clear, the HER existed, right? But the HER archive on Google Cloud is, uh, we don't have it going back that far. Uh, that's great. Uh, there's another question here. It's anonymous, so um, it's, it's not me. <laughs> but uh, there's a question about k-means clustering, and, and this is one that's near and dear to my heart because mm -hmm. um, I always try to find any other clustering method other than k-means, and then I always end up using k-means. So <laughs> can you talk a little bit about if you thought about other ones, if you invested it, and then how, how you ended up at that number of, I think, uh, so, 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 I mean, that's a great, great question. There are obviously other uh, k, you know, clustering methods, vector quantization methods, etc. But I'm a strong believer in if there's a, something that's really easy to use, we should just go use it. And in this case, if you notice, I did my k-means clustering using SQL, right? So I basically had to write three lines of code to do k-means clustering. Anything else would have taken me much longer and would be much harder. So that that is probably that is that is a primary reason why I picked k-means. It's actually k-means plus plus. The primary reason I picked it was that I have the tooling for it. It's really easy to access. Like now, I, I, I could basically use that. That was pretty much the reason. Now we have a, a, a question from Ekta. Uh, what is the difference between image embeddings and image features extracted from VGG style networks or unit style encoder decoder networks? Okay, Why are embeddings preferred over image features? Ah, that, that is a great, great question. So when you do transfer learning using VGGNet or ResNet or ImageNet or anything, you do get a bottleneck layer. That's the that's the layer that you basically get, and you can think of that as an embedding, okay? But remember, how did you get that embedding? You got that embedding because somebody took the VGG net and trained it on an image net model, right? They trained it on a data set that was, that was labeled. Right? They had, somebody had a million images that they labeled for you, and then they trained an ML model, and that's how you got the embedding, okay? The issue there is that somebody had to do the labeling. In this case, I'm able to get my embedding without going through the trouble of labeling one year of weather data, right? So that the, the key difference is that I'm able to do it without labeling, whereas uh, all of those embeddings that you got from BGGNet or ImageNet or ResNet, all of those rely on having a classification model 
that has been trained on with that with that model. So that's the difference. Uh, that's great. So there, I, there's sort of an interesting um, related question that, that uh, David um, posed, uh, which is about the embeddings. And do you think the embeddings could be used for prediction in the future? That is extrapolation. Wow. Mm. Um, and so uh, could you train a model on the embeddings to do something like this? Right. Could you train the model on the embeddings to do prediction? Maybe, but I would rather just train it on the original images, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because like in essence, what do you need for prediction? You need to have the current data and you need to have the data that, ha that actually happened say 24 hours later. And you could basically uh, train it. And there's actually a very nice paper uh, from Google research uh, team that basically did an eight hour prediction of the her images. But that was basically using the original images. You would not use this lower resolution. Again, the whole idea that there's, there's use cases that require a low resolution rep or a, a concise representation. Prediction is not one of them. For prediction, you want to use a full full resolution. Yeah, and I, do, maybe you can answer this question for me, but um, that I, my understanding is the way that prediction is done is they run a lot of models and then choose sort of a consensus. We're talking about the physical uh, mm -hmm. models of weather, that they run many of them and then uh, sample from sort of the, the, the consensus outputs. Is that, is that how it's done with traditional? Not, not quite. So what happens is that uh, you basically have an, uh, you know, Maxwell's equations and they're applied uh, fluid dynamics equations that are applied to uh, a current uh, model of the atmosphere. The, the thing is that that current model of the atmosphere is created through what is called data assimilation. You basically take your current observations and you create this, this, this 4D uh, representation of what the atmosphere looks like and then you apply Maxwell's equations to move them forward. The thing is that all of those require a wide variety of assumptions and parameterization schemes. Your observations are not perfect, so you can perturb those observations. And so you get a number of models that's called an ensemble. And many times that ensemble then is averaged to get your distribution. Okay? But it is essentially uh, a physics, physical models, each of those, each output is a valid physical outcome. Uh, the next question is from Katie. Can you say more about how you're planning to use these techniques in the data assimilation framework? Uh, yeah, that's, that is a much longer, bigger discussion and something that we're starting to work with NOAA. So hopefully a year from now, we'll actually have better answers on that. It's, it's, it's an area that we're exploring. Okay, um, this is a very technical question uh, from uh, David. Uh, you mentioned using pooling layers in your architecture, which allow the convolutional kernel to look at longer range information. Um, have you experimented with uh, using diluted convolution, dilated convolutions instead of pooling? No, I have not, I've not, I've not uh, experimented with the, no. so. Yeah, yeah there, there's, there's more in terms of architecture that we, that we need to try. Uh, you know, it strikes me that, that that's that there, uh, you know, you talked about the, the um, what you had in order to, the hyperparameter search that you did. And it, it strikes me that there, that's, that's an unbounded space for exploration. And um, so it's, it's really hard to sort of, uh, uh, again, think about, you know, how, when you have a working model, what's the next thing to try in, in model building? Um, right. Uh, Nicoletta, is there another uh, question? Um, there? Yeah, here's a practical question. How much does it cost? <laughs> <laughs> How much does it mean? That's to do this particular example. I'm sorry. Okay. So yeah. it took me about, about two hours to train my model, my autoencoder model on the data. So probably about $2. Uh, oh, I see one from eScience's own Valentina. Okay. Uh, she asked about uh, suggestions for efficient ways to visualize large number of embedded images, something more than projecting the points back to 2D 
um, like a, the, you know, the TensorFlow embedding projector does. Um, right, yeah. So with 50 dimensions, it becomes extremely hard. So what I've seen people do is use TSNE or something like that yeah. to further do a, do a reduction and then view that. It's not, it's not the best, but that tends to be common practice. She has a quick follow-up, which is, um, how do you quickly visualize embeddings at different layers? Um, how do you, yeah, how do you quickly, yeah. The thing is like, again, the trick that I've seen is to basically try to get your, your layer to have three, a filter of depth three, and then you can visualize them as color images. So even if you have 50, you basically take those 50, you reduce them into three, and then you visualize them. Like we have one last question <laughs> uh, from Hector again. Um, are image embeddings generalizable? For example, embeddings obtained uh, using whether from one geographical area would work in another area? Yeah, I, I believe so, but we haven't, we haven't tried this. But, the, but, the, but I believe yes, because what, I'm, what I've saw from these weather embeddings is uh, that they were not locality dependent. They, they could actually you know, follow things that happen in diff different areas. Okay. But in general, are the embeddings uh, reusable? And that's again, this goes back to that other question that, some, that someone had about VGG net, et cetera. Our, our experience with those things shows that, yeah, it is probably extremely generalizable because people can take an embedding that was trained VGG net embedding and use it to do a transfer learning on a completely different problem and it seems to work just fine. That's good news. Well, last chance for questions. Um, I wanna say thank you very much. This was a really wonderful talk. And, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate seeing folks in the audience that we don't usually draw in. And I think it's, uh, it's it, your, your talk was really wonderful and, and uh, super well targeted. So thank you very much for that. You're, you're welcome. Thanks, thanks, David. It was it was it was great to uh, get the talk here. And I guess there we'll close the formal program, and I'll stop recording. <laughs>